Hello everyone, uh, welcome back. Um, today we will talk about um, the um, what is called exploratory data analysis. Um, so whenever and wherever data are collected, you will examine them according to their level of measurement, assuming that you already identified what uh, the proper level of measurement for your data. So it is very important that you look at the data closely to find out what the data can tell you before you apply any fancy statistical analysis or modeling. So in statistics, an approach to summarize and visualize the data to have an kind of overview of them is called the exploratory data analysis. So the exploratory data analysis, or EDA for short, is really not about a special technique. Rather, it is more of a kind of a um, philosophical approach to data analysis to maximize insight into a data set collected, which was actively promoted by the American statistician John Tukey in the picture. So in a sense, it is like a, you know, let the data speak for themselves approach to uncover underlying structure of data and to extract important variables and also to detect um, if there's any uh, anomalies or unusual data, um, sometimes called outliers or extreme values. And also um, EDA um, is an approach to uh, test underlying assumptions uh, about the data and ultimately to maximize insight into data by placing them in multiple perspectives or multiple viewpoints. So EDA is um, kind of a more direct way to analyze data by rearranging, visualizing, and summarizing them in as many different ways as possible. So there are um, a number of different ways to explore data. Um, in fact, the very first thing you need to do when you have the raw data is to sort and count, uh, which are now almost completely forgotten steps in the age of computers. However, uh, we should remember that this is the very beginning of any analysis. So if you have a large data set, then many times uh, you want to divide it into several groups um, and then that can be quite useful to find out what's really going on and better yet um, you can display or visualize um, your data set which is at the heart of the um, EDA uh, because a picture can be a very effective medium to get the message across when it is drawn correctly <clears throat> And we will have a you know more more chance to uh, talk about these uh, visualization more detail as we go along, and finally we can summarize data uh, with a couple of numbers that represent the center center of a data set and how much overall spread there is from the center in the data set, which are called measures of central tendency and of dispersion. Now let's take a look at each step of EDA starting from sorting and counting with some data. So let's pretend that you are a lab technician who is responsible for taking care of lab mice. So here is um, the record of age of mice measured in weeks. So here the variable being measured um, is called the age of mice and the data collected for the variable um, are the number of weeks. So now when you have a data set like this, the very first thing you want to do is to count the total number of data. Um, this is important because the count can provide um, information about you know whether you measured everything you want to measure and sometimes there may be an extra data included that should not be there so um how many age data do you 
uh, do we have here? So uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And we have two rows of eleven. So the total number of data here is 22. So when we um, report uh, the number of data, we typically use a small n um, for number, right? So n equals 22. So that is our uh, number of data set we have here. And by the way, um, what do you think is the level of measurement for the age data, so the age of mice, what is the level of a measurement for this variable? Well, I'll let you figure it out. And so now we know how many um, uh, data we have for the uh, variable age of mice. Um, now, the next step is to actually sort this data uh, to see um, you know, what's going on with this age of mice. So let's just sort this in ascending order. So once we sort them uh, this way, we can see that the youngest mouse is 21 weeks and the oldest my mouse is 69, uh, 69 weeks. Um, when you have a large data, so even though you know this is not that large, um, it is sometimes more useful um, to split the data into a manageable number of groups events or categories and count how many data would occur in each category or group. Um, so we can do so by making a what is called grouped frequency table um, as shown here. So here I split the age range into five groups already for you. And the first age group starts from 20 weeks and ends right before 30 weeks. So here um, I have kind of a bracket notations, uh, which you um, haven't seen this before. So this um, square bracket on the left of uh, the age limit, the, 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 the limit of the, uh, the group um, is um, meaning that this is a inclusive of the left limit. So this interval this age interval will start from the 20 including the 20 up until 30 weeks exclusive of so this round bracket means exclusive of the right uh, um, the limit on the left of that bracket and then we can start the next interval from exactly 30 including 30 and run up to week 40 not including that limit in that way we can have continuous continuous intervals without any gap between the intervals okay so let's just count um how many data would fall in each age group so for this 20 to 30 the first age group we have 21 27 but not 30, right? Because the first interval does not include 30. So we need to stop there. So the frequency or the count of observations or the data is 2 for the first age group. Now we move on to the next age group running from 30 to 40. So we have this, this, this till here. So we have five of them, right? because we do not include 40. So that's five. And the next 40 to 50, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have eight. And the next group, one, two, three, four, four. And then the remaining data are three. Okay. So this is an example of a grouped frequency table. And 
as you can see, the middle age group is the um, the most frequent age group, right? So what we just um, uh, kind of calculated was what's called absolute frequency. Right? So that is the actual number of observations within an interval or a group. However, um, there are a number of different ways uh, to count the data or the, to calculate the frequency of data. So the cumulative frequency is a summed frequency up to the current and all the preceding intervals or groups. On the other hand, the, the, the relative frequency is the frequency of an interval or a group divided by the total number of observations across the intervals or groups. And finally, the cumulative relative frequency is uh, the cumulative frequency at the current interval or group divided by the total number of observations across the intervals or groups. So let's calculate the, uh, each frequency using uh, the uh, the mouse example, right? So this was the absolute frequency we just calculated, right? Um, now for the uh, cumulative frequency, and by definition, it's a summed frequency up to the current frequency, right? because we do not have any preceding, uh, preceding um, intervals, um, because this is a first interval, and the cumulative frequency for the first age group is still 2. It is the same as the absolute frequency. But now, the cumulative frequency of the second interval is... ...7, right? Because the current absolute frequency is 5, and you want to add the frequency of the preceding intervals. So, the cumulative frequency for the second interval becomes 7. And now, the third one is 2 plus 5 plus 8. So that becomes 15. Okay, so the current frequency of the third interval is this, or you have to add this and that to have the cumulative frequency of the third interval, okay? So now the next one is just 15, move 15 here, and add four, that should 19. And then 19 plus three becomes 22. So please note that you have total frequency um, of the absolute frequencies, right? If you add all these frequencies up, right, then it should become 22, which should be the same as the total number of observations you have. In the cumulative frequency, you do not have any total, right? But the last entry, the last cumulative frequency should be the same as the total number of um, observations or the cumulative frequency. Now, the relative frequency is the absolute frequency divided by the total number of observation. So that's 2 divided by 22, right? And the second, the relative frequency for the second interval is 5 over 22, 8 over 22, 4 over 22, and 3 over 22. And the total um, relative frequency should be 22 over 22, 1, right? So the total um, relative frequency should be always, always add up to 1, okay? And finally, the cumulative relative frequency is basically the, um, the relative frequency of the cumulative frequency. So 2 over 22. And now we're going to have to use the cumulative frequency, 7 over 22, 
and 15 over 22 19 over 22 <clears throat> 22 over 22 and there's no total for the cumulative relative frequency so this is how you calculate all these different frequencies now we can summarize these frequencies in pictures instead of numbers and it can be more effective way to summarize frequency information um, so we can visualize the frequency information in two ways depending upon the level of measurements so if you have a categorical data such as a nominal or ordinal level of measurements then a bar graph can be used as a graphical representation of frequency information so as an example let's say um, in the previous age data you know say 10 of them were male and remaining 12 were female um, because gender is a nominal variable a bar graph is a proper um, choice of visualization to display the frequency of each category so to draw a bar graph you need to draw the axis first then the categories of the nominal variable goes to the one axis uh, in this case the vertical axis right so we already have um, you know male and female as a category on this vertical axis um, and then the frequency information for each category goes on the other axis to show comparisons among discrete categories so like this so height of each bar should actually correspond to the frequency information so the male we have 10 and 12 for female right so bar graph can be useful to point out the order um, and the relative importance between different categories when there are many categories under a variable um, in addition, bar graph can be used for more complex representation of data by grouping or stacking um, when the variable is nested with subcategories. Um, so oftentimes we wish to compare the results of different surveys or of different con conditions or groups within the same overall survey. In this case, we are comparing the distributions of responses between the surveys or conditions. So the bar graph uh, uh, can be often a, uh, are often uh, an excellent tool for il illustrating differences between two distributions. Um, this figure um, is known to be the first bar graph invented by the Scottish engineer William Playfair which first appeared in his publication called Commercial and Political Atlas in 1786. So in this grouped bar graph, we can see uh, the uh, Scotland's imports and exports in sterling pounds to and from 17 different countries sorted by the export amount represented by black bars. People sometimes like to add extra features to graphs just because they can and they think it looks cool and fancy. So for example, you have probably seen this kind of three-dimensional uh, bar graph before, but you know, usually this representation um, is not as effective as their two-dimensional counterparts because the extra added dimension does not convey any additional information and sometimes it may confuse more than help so as a general rule you want to minimize uh, any unnecessary bells and whistles in um, any visualization another way to visualize the frequency information for continuous data such as interval or ratio level of measurements is to use histogram so what we see here is a histogram of 80 observations of intraocular pressure. So the pressure in the eye. Right? So it is typical that measurement values go to the x-axis and the frequency information um, 
go to the uh, y axis. So with a large enough data set, a histogram can show the overall shape of the frequency distribution of the data. And please note that the bars are drawn to touch each other in histogram, whereas bars in the bar graph are not. So this is the major difference between the bar graph and the histogram, right? Because the histogram is used for the continuous data. So that, that's why the bars are touching to show that the variable we are you know, displaying is actually continuous. So there's no gap in the measurement, right? On the other hand, the bars in the bar graph are not touching each other because they are discrete, right? So they are not supposed to touch each other because they are not continuous. So that is the major difference uh, between the bar graph and the histogram. With um, bar graph and a histogram, you can visualize the frequency information of data. Um, but there are other uh, visualization to summarize the data set in different ways. Uh, to understand the components of those um, other visualization, we need to first talk about you know, how to summarize the data with a few numbers. So in practice, any data set can be summarized with two numbers. Uh, where one representing the center of the data set and the other representing the spread of the data set. In any publication, it is pretty much a standard procedure to report a pair of one measure of central tendency and a measure of dispersion as a simple summary of data. Now we're going to discuss an important and basic uh, concept in statistics, which is called central tendency. Um, of which concept you may be already um, familiar with, but um, you simply may not have realized it, it was called central tendency. So there are many definitions of center of a distribution. Uh, typically, the following three central tendency measures are most frequently used in statistics mean, median, and mode. So first, um, the simplest central tendency measure is the mode, which is defined as the most frequent observation. This can be calculated for any levels of measurement, as counting is all that is required to calculate the mode. In case of categorical data, such as nominal or ordinal levels of measurements, the calculation of the mode is quite straightforward. However, with continuous data such as interval or ratio levels of measurement, where the data are measured with many decimal places, the frequency of each value is typically one because uh, the same score is rarely obtained more than once, if any. So for example, if um, you measure glucose concentrations of different people, and this is a measure with like a two decimal precision, then no two concentrations would be exactly the same. Then how do you calculate the mode when every score has a frequency of one? And the solution to this problem is to compute the mode from a grouped frequency table and draw a histogram. As mode is the most frequent observation in the data set, the mode is the value at the peak um, in the histogram. So here is an ex um, example histogram of some exam scores. And if you look at uh, the histogram, the histogram is picking at um, around like a score of 50, right? So you can say that the mode of this exam scores uh, of this data is 50. Depending upon the number of outstanding peaks in a histogram, a distribution may be called bimodal when there are two peaks um, like this, or um, a distribution is called multimodal when there are more than two distinct peaks, uh, like in this case. 
another central tendency measure is median, uh, which is uh, literally means the middle score. By definition, median is the value that divides the data into two groups containing an equal number of observations. Because you need to be able to rank order between the values to calculate the median, um, you can only calculate this quantity for the ordinal or above levels of measurement. And you cannot calculate median for the nominal. So that, what that means is that you cannot calculate the median for the nominal level of data. And by the way, please note that uh, I'm going to use a different data set here than the previous visual QT1 uh, for the uh, illustration purposes. So the data here are the uh, number of Facebook friends your fr uh, Facebook friends have. So if you do have a Facebook account, then you probably know uh, what this is, right? So if you have an account, then you can go to your Facebook friends pro a profile to find out how many Facebook friends each of your Facebook friends has, right? So this is the data um, you know, taken. It is kind of a hypothetical data. Say, you know, this is coming from my own Facebook. And then these are the, so let's just say that I only have 11 um, Facebook friends. And these numbers represent how many uh, Facebook friends my Facebook friends have. So to calculate the median, then you need to sort the data first. Right. Um, then find the score, splitting the number of data into lower and upper equal halves. So here we have an odd number of data, right? 11. So n, in this case, n, well, n. Eleven, right? So you only have to find uh, the middle number, and so the middle number here is ninety-eight, right? That's because from ninety-eight above and below, you have five and five, right? So we have exactly the same number of data, five and five above and below this value of 98 right so in this case the median so i will say this is a median one is so this is our median value 98 right so now you think you know that the, the one of your friend is a kind of oddball um, as that person seems to have an unrealistic number of friends so I'm talking about this one, right? So over 2,000 Facebook friends. So it seems like uh, this friend is a celebrity or something. So you want to calculate the median again after you remove this celebrity friend. Okay, so you just remove this. Okay. Now, then the number of Facebook friends, I mean, the, the, the size of the data, right? The, the number of sample in this data set is now becomes 10. Right? So now we have even number of data. Then how do we calculate the median? So in this case, um, what? right. Um, You need to find out um, two middle scores, splitting the number of data into same lower and upper halves, and calculate the average of the two scores. So if you just look at this data now, these two scores are two middle scores, right? So from these two scores, we have four and four here, right? So the median is just average between these two numbers divided by two, okay? So that's, and it's 
two. So that's ninety five point five. So that is our median number two. So that's just a median without this extreme score, right? But if you compare this value, 95.5 and 98, so regardless of the extreme value uh, or the outlier in a data set, um, the median doesn't really change much, right? So in fact, this is one of the properties of a median that you know, this central tendency measure is relatively unaffected by the extreme values or outliers at either end of the data. All right, so last central tendency measurement is the mean, um, also known as the average. Um, there are different kinds of means um, we can calculate, but here, we will only talk about the most commonly known arithmetic mean uh, because this is probably the most frequently reported central tendency measure in statistics for interval and ratio level of measurement. Um, I'm pretty sure that you, know, you all know how to calculate the mean, but here we have a formula to calculate a sample mean. So here, the x bar, so that's how you read it. x bar is a sample mean. Right? And that equals to, and this symbol here is Greek letter. It's, a, it's kind of a same as, it's a similar to the capital S. And this is red sigma, sig. Right, and in mathematics, uh, mathematics and the statistics, this symbol sigma means adding or summing what's coming on the right, right? So whatever comes on the right of this symbol means add all the numbers on the right. So I here is have an index of data. So add the data from the first data to the n which is the last member of the data. So add from the first data to the end, that's what it means. All these are subscript and superscript, right? So that has to do with the data index here. So from I equals one to N. So here, if you look at this data, right? Up here, this number of Facebook friend. So we have the first data I, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So we have uh, eleven data. So you add the first data, which is fifty-seven, to the last n equals eleven, which is twenty-two. So you add them all up to calculate the simple mean. Plus, 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 plus. Right, so you add all these up, and then what do you do? And to calculate the, just erase this. After you add those numbers, now you divide this by the number of score, which is eleven, right? Then you're going to get the sample mean. So the sum, right, so it's the sum of all data equals actually 3051. So you can use your calculator to see if this is correct, but the total uh, um, sum of the score is 3151. And we have n equals 11. So x bar equals n3151 over 11. And this will be 
286.45. So that is how we calculate the mean. Now, just for the sake of the illustration, because we just did this to calculate the median. Now, let's say you do not want to include that celebrity friend. Okay, so you remove remove this friend and do the calculation again, right? So you just add all the numbers except for that large number. So you do this sum again. There's sum one and sum two. It will become eight hundred and eleven. Now our n becomes 10, right? Because we remove one out of 11 data. So the n is now, so that's x bar one, x bar two becomes eight, 11 over 10, right? So that's 81.1, right? So if you compare these two, you can see that there's quite a lot of change, right? Uh, depending upon uh, the existence of outlier or the extreme value. So unlike median, mean, the mean is heavily uh, influenced by extreme values or outliers. From here on, we will talk about the uh, quantities that describe how much a data set is spread out from the center. So the most uh, simple one um, would be the range, which is a difference between the limits. Um, in other words, maximum minus minimum. So we already have seen this uh, statistics before when we needed to determine the width of a bin to construct a histogram. So the minimum level of measurement of data to calculate the range should be ordinal and above because you need to be able to find minimum and maximum. So that actually implies um, you can rank order uh, the data, right? So which is a property of the ordinal level of a measurement. So you cannot calculate the range for nominal data either. And like the mean, the range is also sensitive to extreme values in a data set. So let's just work with the same um, the you know data, uh, the number of Facebook friends um, like before. So it's easy to calculate the range because um, this is already sorted and the maximum is uh, 2,340 and the minimum is this. So 22, 2 is uh, 23, 18. So that is the range, right? So um, that's the range for the original data, but let's just remove. Okay, so now place just. Well, let's remove this, right? Because this is the odd one. And now new maximum becomes 121. So that's range one, so range so 121 minus 22, that's 99. It is, right? So if you compare these two ranges, you can see that there's a quite a lot of difference um you know when there is an extreme value or not so um as i already said range is also sensitive to the extreme values in a data set another useful dispersion statistics is called a, an interquartile range or iqr for short so to calculate the iqr you need to calculate the quartiles first which is a special kind of quantiles 
uh, and then quantiles are the yeah, cut points dividing the range of observations into the smaller and equal proportions. Um, so the number of divided groups is always one more than a specific quantile. So therefore, quartiles are the three cut points that divide an ordered data set into four groups, each comprising a quarter of the data, right? So you have to remember this is a three points, not four points uh, dividing the data set, okay? So the first quartile, um, also known as Q1 or the lower quartile or 25th percentile, um, is the, uh, the quartile uh, below which the lowest 25% of the data are located. And then the second quartile is Q2, and this is basically the median by definition, or this is also known as 50, uh, 50th percentile. So the second quartile cuts the data set in a lower half and upper half. And finally, third quartile, Q3, known as upper quartile or the 75th percentile. And so this is the quartile um, above which the highest 25% of the data will be found. So the interquartile range, IQR, is basically the difference between the upper and lower quartiles. So IQR equals Q3 minus Q1. Okay, so let's find out uh, interquartile range for this number of Facebook friends data. So the data, so to, uh, you know, like, you know, like to find the median, um, you know, you need to sort the data first, and then this is sorted already. And when you have even an odd number of data, so like here, uh, we have 11 um, number of data set. So you know, easiest um, step to find the uh, IQR is to find median first. So we know the median is the middle number. We know that that is median, right? So that is our Q2. So that's Q2. And now we have lower half. And then Q1 is median of the lower half. So 53 is basically the Q1. And 116 is the median of Q, uh, the upper half. That's Q3. So IQR becomes 116 minus 53. So that's 63. So that is the IQR for um, this data. As long as you know how to calculate the median, then finding an IQR should not be so difficult whether or not you have an odd or even number of data. Um, you can just follow the uh, steps here, then it should be easy enough. So once we know the quartiles, then we can draw a box plot to graphically summarize how the data are distributed. It is composed of the following components. Um, so first, along the vertical axis, in, at the vertical axis of the data values, we have a box, right? And then two lines coming uh, out of the box. Um, so coming out of the, uh, the lower hinge and the upper hinge of the box. So the line inside the box represents the location of the median, so which is uh, you know Q2, right? And the upper hinge, right, um, where the upper quartile is, and then lower hinge is the location of the lower quartile. So by definition, um, the uh, the length of the box, right, or the width of the box is. IQR interquartile range. And the two vertical lines coming out of the box are called whiskers. And then upper whisker stops at the largest 
data, not the maximum, um, the largest data smaller than the 1.5 times IQR, right? And then likewise, um, so any, any um, you know, data um, that is outside of this range uh, will be flagged as an outlier. So that is an outlier. And then, so the lower whisker uh, is actually stops at the smallest data um, that is larger than 1.5 times IQR below the first quartile. And then that dot is um, called an outlier. So this is the um, box plot for the number of Facebook friends data. So a box plot can be drawn upright or sideways, uh, which, whichever way you prefer, as long as it is parallel to the axis with the data values. So here we have um, number of Facebook friends on the horizontal axis, right? And these two um, diagonal bar is called um, the axis break, right? Because this um, celebrity friend is just um, um, too far away from the rest of the data, right? So you cannot really, um, you know, place this uh, data in the linear scale, right? So this is just so far out, right? So in that case, you can use axis break, right? That, you know, this axis is still um, continuing up to this value. So that's, um, you know, what you need to use when you have uh, extreme data and to um, draw those um, data in a single graph. Um, so the, this is a Q1, right? So 53 was the Q1, the lower quartile that we calculated before. And this uh, bar is actually the Q2, 98. That was our median, right? And also 116 was our Q3. And then upper whisker stops at 121. And because this, you know, 2340 is just too far out, this is a flagged as an outlier. So obviously this will be um, greater than uh, 1.5 times IQR plus Q3, right? And then the lower whisker stops at 22 um, because 22 is the minimum value and it's still within the 1.5 times IQR from the first quartile. So this is basically how you draw a box plot. For the um, interval and ratio levels of a measurement, measures of dispersion is typically calculated from the mean. So um, the deviance is the uh, distance of individual datum from the mean. So you will have the same number of deviant statistics as the number of raw data. So here X represents the data, right? So and as we have seen, X bar represents the sample mean. So that is that is the mean of the X uh, data, right? And then, so because there's the same number of deviant statistics as the raw data, uh, that's not really summarize the dispersion of the data sets, right? So we want to have just a single number to summarize the total amount of um, spread or uh, dispersion, right? So you can add all these deviant statistics to have a single number. But if you do that, then you will get zero always for any data because the deviance is the distance from the mean with sign. So if you add them up, then they always cancel each other. So one way to avoid this is to square each deviance first to remove the sign, then add them all up. Um, now that quantity is called sum of squared errors. Right? Now, 
If you divide this quantity by the number of data minus 1, then we obtain a statistics called variance, which is roughly the average square distance of the data from the mean. Now, if you think about it, this is a bit awkward quantity because it's squared a squared value, so, so is the original unit of measurement. So, for example, um, if you measured height in centimeter, then the unit of the mean should be the same centimeter, right? However, the variance will be in the unit of centimeter squared. Therefore, you cannot directly pair the variance with the mean because they are in different units. So now we take the square root on the variance to get the original unit of measurement back. And this final quantity is called standard deviation, which is the average amount of distance in the data from the mean. So this is basically kind of by showing you the steps to calculate standard deviation. Um, the um, calculation of standard deviation is quite um, involving, but this is a very important statistics. So I strongly recommend that you practice and understand thoroughly how to calculate the um, standard deviation uh, step by step. So um, the very first step in calculating a standard deviation is to work out the um, average of the data first. So in this first column, so we have Facebook friends, and this is the raw data, right? So you need to calculate the mean of this data set first by adding, adding them all up and divide this by uh, the number of data, which is 11. Okay, so then that's, the mean of the data, right? And then once you have the mean, then you have to work out the difference, which is the deviance between each number and the mean. So you subtract this from this, and you subtract this and that, and you subtract this uh, from this. So you get 11, uh, which is the same number of deviance statistics. So, and the next is, the deviance, right? So these are the individual deviants from the mean, but if you add all this up, then they cancel each other out, right? So you get zero, so that is the total deviance. You always get zero, so to avoid this, now you have to square each deviance statistics. And then you get these large numbers, right, large values. Now you can add them all up. So that big sigma sign is the adding sign, adding whatever is on the right here in the bracket. Right, so what's in the bracket is the deviance, and it is squared. And if you sum them up from the first data to 11th data, the last one, and this is a sum of the squared error, and you get this value. Now, to um, calculate the average amount of a square difference, you divide this value by 10, 11 minus 1 instead of 11, right? So this is what is called degrees of freedom, uh, which I'm going to um, try to explain. Um, later, and then this uh, value, this quantity is called variance, right? But because this is a squared unit, uh, you want to actually take take a square root on this variance to get the um, original unit back, right? So now this, um, you you take the square root of the variance, then you have standard deviation. All right, so uh, now we have seen how to calculate the uh, standard deviation, and I also want you to understand how to calculate the uh, standard deviation, and hopefully you can calculate standard deviation on your own um, when you are given relatively smaller data set.
Um, I mean, you have, you know, Jamovi or, you know, statistical software. So really, you don't really need to calculate the standard deviation by hand, but um, you want to understand how it is calculated so that you um, better understand, um, you know, what it really represents. Right. So here are the properties of the sample standard deviation. So standard deviation measures the average spread, the average amount of spread um, about the mean in the data set. And it should be, so because it is using the mean um, to calculate the standard deviation, right? So you this standard deviation should be used only when the mean is chosen to represent the center of the data. What that means is that you cannot pair the standard deviation statistics with median, okay? Because standard deviation is the distance from the mean. So it doesn't really make sense to pair this up with other uh, central tendency measure. It always goes with uh, mean, okay? And standard deviation is always positive, And in rare cases, it can be zero when all the data set had the same value, right? And if um, there's a more spread in the data set, then it'll be shown as a larger standard deviation. And as I said, standard deviation has the same uh, measurement unit as the original observations, um, as opposed to variance where it has squared um, unit, right? And because the standard deviation um, uses the mean, um, it is also sensitive to outliers or extreme values in the data, like the mean was sensitive to those extreme values or outliers. Okay, now um, I think I need to explain why um, the sum of the squared errors is divided by n minus one instead of n in calculating variance or standard deviation, um, as opposed to you divide the sum of the data by n when you're calculating the mean. So um, the reason uh, has to do with um, the concept of degrees of freedom, uh, which is the uh, number of data that can freely vary in calculating a sample statistics. So um, let me use some analogy here to uh, make it more uh, understandable, I hope. So let's say that um, you are given the um, kind of a power or responsibility. You're, you're being a coach to select players from the entire Scotland for a Olympic uh, national football team. So as you probably know, the minimum required number of players um, for a team, for a football team is 11, right? So imagine that you are to pick a player by field positions, then there is practically unlimited um, number of possibilities or combinations. So you have this freedom to pick anyone and place any first 10 players on the field, um, except the last one, uh, meaning that once you fill the first 10 positions, then the position of the last member of the team is whatever and whoever it is fixed. For example, you can pick and place them like um, three, four, three. So this is just a, just one example, but you know, in theory, um, you can just do this any way you want, right? If you don't like, say, this guy, then you can just kick him out and then replace this member uh, with other players from the population. And so there's just millions of different uh, possibilities to have a team. But once you fill the first 10 members for the team, then the last member of the team, the position of the last member, is fixed so somebody has to be a goalie right and this is just the same for any position if you fill the first 10 position 
then the position of the last member is fixed and you cannot change it. Okay, so in calculating a statistics from a sample is like this. So basically you see um, you calculate the sample standard deviation given the sample, right? Say you have a sample of X with all the same numbers. So now your sample size is three, and you can calculate. So this is your first sample, and x bar for the first sample is three. Right? The mean is the same as the um, the member of the data because all the members are the same in this case, right? So given the sample size of three, um, the sample mean uh, uh, for this sample is fixed to three, and this three is used to calculate the standard deviation, right? So we cannot change this sample mean um, to calculate the standard deviation. If you, if we change the sample mean, then you know it'll change the standard deviation. But without changing the sample mean, we can still um, have different samples with the same sample size and the same sample mean of three. Right, having different members. So, for example, in the population, we can have another sample by replacing the first two members with one and four, um, having the same sample mean of three. So, you can freely change the first two members to this one. But once you do that, then the number of the last data, the value of the last data is fixed to have the same sample mean of three. Right? So in this case, this should be um, four, right? To have the same sample mean of three. So this is determined. So you can have actually millions of this. So say x. Hmm, um three equals two two so you can still replace the members until the last one so once you change the first two to two two then the last one should be five to have the same sample mean of three and there can be millions of such samples uh, can exist right so um, this, you know, the, the sample, um, the collector sample is like your team, right? Um, once the team is fixed, then you cannot change the team. I mean, the, the, the team as a whole, but you can still replace the members until the last member. Because once you change um, the M minus one members, then the, uh, the nth member, is actually fixed, right? So that is a, a concept of degrees of freedom. So what that means is that not everyone, so you have to actually take away one from the number of observations because not, uh, not all the members can freely vary in calculating a standard deviation because if you do that, then you, you're gonna change the sample mean, right? So that is the concept of degrees of freedom. So this is just what I've been saying already. Um, so degrees of freedom is related to uh, the number of observations um, you can really change in computing a statistics. So if a statistics is held constant, so if it is a fixed, so in our case, it was mean, right? To calculate another statistics, which was uh, standard deviation. And in a given sample, then the degrees of freedom must be one less than the sample size. So um, in our case, we have to take away one from the total number of observations in calculating 
the standard deviation because the sample mean is fixed. So you cannot uh, replace, you cannot use all the members of uh, the data, uh, all the members of the sample to calculate the standard deviation um, given the sample. So I, I you know, took this much time to explain what the degrees of freedom is um, just because um, you have to know the degrees of freedom of whatever statistics you calculate. So it is the standard procedure you report the degrees of freedom for any statistics if there is any degrees of freedom involved, right? So um, it is important that you know the concept of degrees of freedom. So there's a such thing as degrees of freedom and don't forget to report the degrees of freedom for any statistics. And this will become um, more important as we go along because there are um, you know, different statistics um, involving different number of degrees of freedom. And so we're gonna just talk more about this degrees of freedom later on. So the notation for degrees of freedom is new. So that is not B, it is new in Greek letter. Okay, so that uh, is actually standing for degrees of freedom. Or in more plain English, people use DF for degrees of freedom or D dot F dot for degrees of freedom whatsoever. Okay, the last measures of dispersion is coefficient of variation or CV for short. Um, this is also known as relative standard deviation and you know which is a dimensionless quantity normalizing the amount of variation by its own mean. So more often than not um, variation in sample data scales with mean of the sample. So in other words the amount of variation tends to increase as sample mean increases. So um, this quantity is useful to compare the amount of variation between variables with different units or widely different means. So these two histograms are the distributions of foot width and length of males based on the um, anthropometric survey of American military personnel in 1988. So until 2012, this was the most comprehensive publicly available data set on body size and shape. So this um, data set includes measurements of over 140 body parts for nearly 4,000 adult U.S. military personnel. So if we look at the uh, descriptive statistics, uh, the mean foot width is 100 millimeter or 10 centimeters uh, with a standard deviation of 5 millimeter. Whereas the uh, mean foot length is 270 millimeter, which is about um, UK size 9, with a standard deviation of 13.5 millimeter. So, in absolute terms, the standard deviation of a foot length is more than twice that of the uh, foot width, right? So, does that mean then there is a more variation in the foot length compared to the foot width? given the quality of measurement, uh, measurement was same for both measurement? And probably not, because um, as I said, standard deviation typically scales with the mean. And we can see that the mean of foot length is also more than twice the mean of the foot width. So to compare, if there's indeed more variation in foot length compared to foot width, we can um, calculate the uh, coefficient of variation for a fair and square comparison. So that is quite simple. It is just a um, standard deviation uh, of the sample divided by its own mean. So we just do 5 over 100. Okay, so that's Five percent, right? And for the uh, foot length, it's thirteen five over two seventy. 
So that's probably another Right. So um, with this calculation, we know that the variation is uh, that between the foot length and foot width measurement is actually the same, right? And this can be actually shown in the histogram, um, assuming that they are um, normalized. So see the spread of the foot width measurement uh, looks almost the um, the same as the um, the, the spread of the yeah, the foot length. So um, the theoretical normal PDF that's a you know a probability density function. So that's kind of a um, the best fitting curve on this histogram, and it looks like uh, and the me measurements um, for both foot width and foot length. And looks like a very symmetric around the center, which is one of the properties of the normal distribution, which is going to be the next topic of uh, the module.